the fourth lecture on dark matter uh, by Farinaldo. Did anyone not sign the presence sheet? Great. So it's outside, uh, just to be sure. So we can start. Thanks. Hello, hello, yeah. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I guess the warning Martin gave yesterday worked. Uh, <coughs> so I will not dwell on the importance of you arriving early. <coughs> so this is, my first slide is just an invitation to everybody here. Uh, next year we will have a conference in Natal, Brazil. This is northeast of Brazil, okay, so for those who have never been to Natal, just have spent two days. It's very risky that you want to stay more days. Uh, <coughs> so you'll be focused on dark matter and neutrino physics, and since I mentioned the very first talk, that dark matter, the dark matter problem comprises more than just particle physics, so you might have connections to different areas of physics, including collider astrophysics and neutrino physics. Because you'll be in September next year. And some of the people who are attending this conference will be there. This workshop will be there. School slash workshop. And uh, there'll be plenty of good people over there. So one thing that I might point out for the students and young scientists, so I'm also including myself a young scientist, <laughs> there'll be awards for the best posters and talks. So I'm not telling what this award is, but I'm be confident that's pretty damn good. Okay, so th there will be awards for the best talks and 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 posters, and s will be some funding. There will be some funding f to f finance the students to go to Natal. Okay, limited, but there will be some. Huh? Why? Well, he promised he would be there. If he tries, maybe he might die, right, on the process. But that's why he agreed. If he's not there, so he said there will be something like the SBF meeting that we had, so it would be a video conference or something like that. But he said he will make the effort, so we'll see. So I don't want him to die trying to go to Natal anyways. <laughs> <coughs> so I will just start from the, the point I finished yesterday. Uh, instead of going through the zoo of dark matter, can definitely I will not have time to go through all of them. Today, I change a little bit what I'm going to present. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over some of the dark matter models in the literature and say, explain to you how you can have a feasible dark matter model, how you can have a feasible dark matter candidate in each one of these popular dark matter models in the literature. Okay? So whether is the production of dark matter is via the freeze out, freezing, thermal production, non thermal production, and so on. So more concrete examples. So we finished <laughs> the lecture yesterday talking about the the evolution of the number density of particles, which are like cold relics, and as I mentioned. Let's say I'm going to put just some numbers here for the. So the annihilation rate of two incoming dark matter particles. In this picture, sets was the abundance of dark matter particles today. So depending on how strongly those dark matter particles interact with, with the standard model particles, I know how much 
leftover abundance of dark matter I have. The larger the cross section, the larger the sigma v, the longer the time they remain in equilibrium with the standard model particles, so I have fewer dark matter particles at the end because the number density of particles is Boltzmann suppressed. Okay, so that's the called, I said, two by two process. And since this cross section, which is sort of the favored one, you get the omega of around 0.3 for dark matter. I need this one. And this one happens to be around the weak scale, so you have this solved this so-called WIMP miracle, okay? <coughs> Which I explained is not really a miracle. Uh <coughs> anyways, so given this cross section, you can get this abundance of 0.3. And the assumptions I've made is that we are within the lambda CDM model. Nothing happens in the standard model during this entire process. This process is two by two. Nothing sketchy is going on. So it's just very simple, that's what you get. However, these are at least these three ones. The one I mentioned yesterday is that if you have this process is not like this, you can break down like this. Whatever you have, I'll put a V. Where the cross section for this process is one over S minus M V squared. And S is related to the center of mass energy. If the center of mass energy happens to be at near the mass of the mediator, then this cross section explodes. So you have a pole. It's a way of reducing, changing your predictions for the relic density depending on the mass of you have for the dark matter particle. Okay? So this is sort of the first caveat, the first exception for these vanilla expectation for the relic density, which we call the resonance. The second one we have co-annihilation. What is this co-annihilation is there are three, okay? So in this original paper of 96 or something, there were three. Today, we know there are way more than three. There are about six. But I'll just mention some of them. Uh, <coughs> for the co-annihilation, happens that, let's say that I have a model where it's not just one dark matter particle around. Okay? I have more than one. One particle which is sort of stable. I have more than one. It might not be the dark matter, but let's say I have a particle which is stable when these dark metal particles start to annihilate into standard model particles. I have many variations to that scenario. I'm just saying, let's say that I have another particle which is close in mass to the dark metal particle. Okay? So if it's close in mass, so that's one of the exercises I can give it to you, just for those who are interested. Uh, you can show that the so the number density of in equilibrium for the resonance, for the co-annihilation, so I'm going to erase this part, so if I put this like a phi or dark matter q, whatever that is, this dark matter particle 2 if it's slightly, if the mass is, is smaller, a bit smaller than the dark matter particle mass, what happens is that the number density of this particle in equilibrium will change. So whatever happens in here, so this picture have dark matter, dark matter, center model, center model. So have two by two. Anything, I mean, literally, anything I change from this picture will change my prediction for the relic density. So one, I just said, I'm just picking the mass, so I'm this diagram remains the same. If I just pick the mass, I break this diagram into this, I pick the mass such that I am in the resonance, I change this result. Now I'm saying, okay, for now, let's say I have dark matter one and dark matter two. 
and their mass difference between them is something, delta m. So I have delta m over t. Remember, this scenario is dark matter 1, dark matter 2, the same there, v, center model, center model. What I'm trying to say is the number density, the ratio of the number density between this particle and this particle is given by this. Why this term? Well, as I just said, if they're known, if they are called relics, the number density is Boltzmann suppressed, and their masses will de determine the difference in the Boltzmann suppression, which will be delta m over t. I'm not going to show this, but it's, it's trivial. The number density of how many particles I have here in the initial state? Two. So I have n chi squared. The number density of dark matter particles is squared. The result that you get for the dark matter particle abundance in this scenario for co-annihilation will be exponential of 2 delta m over t omega of dark matter. I'm going to call this one just the this one is dark matter here. This is the same dark matter there. Just look at this expression. Even if you didn't understand the logic behind this, just think of this. So if I have two dark matter particles which are identical in mass, they annihilate into standard model particles. Fine. So you're just saying for an order that the abundance is around 0.3 if the cross section is around, around the weak scale. Fine. Now let's assume that, I don't know, I have a more complicated model. It's not just so naive. And I have more than one species of dark matter particle. Let's just assume for that, for the moment. So what happens to this prediction? It happens that the final abundance of dark matter at the end will change by delta m over t. What I'm saying is, if it's delta m over t is close to 1, I can change by s a, few, a few factors the final abundance of dark matter at the very end. And if delta m is much larger than t, then the ab final abundance of dark matter can be much larger. So look, I'm not telling you what the dark matter mass is. I'm just saying the difference in mass will change my prediction. So here, I was picking the mass such that matches the mediator mass, the central mass energy such that matches the mediator mass. And then I can change this vanilla prediction. Here, what I'm saying is the splitting, the mass splitting between these two initial particles, I can play around and then get a, an enhancement in the dark matter abundance. Is that clear? Yes? Th does not depend on the in which sense? I don't know. It yeah, so what I'm saying is as long as these two dark matter particles can interact via something, this result is valid. So they have to interact with themselves, that's what I'm saying. So if they have these two incoming particles and interact this way. So it cannot, this is a V, right? But it can be whatever. As long as these two particles can f see each other, that happens. If they don't see each other, then it's, this won't happen. So I need that to happen. These particles, that they have to interact with each other, so this takes place. So this is called the co-annihilation. So you have a co-annihilating particle that changes the final abundance of my dark matter particle. Okay. So this is a second uh, exception for the relic density for the estimate. And they say, oh, Fernando, you're saying that you can increase the dark matter abundance by picking some delta m over t that increases the final overall abundance. Fine. But I can so. Let's say that my abundance initially was already 0.3. So I don't need to do anything like that because I already have the 0.3. But let's say my model naively expected that the abundance was very large. It was very large. So how can I, in my model, reduce that abundance to go back to 0.3? Ah, easy. I just picked the mass of dark metal particles such that there is resonance 
happens because if the happens the ha the resonance happens, the abundance goes one over sigma by bring down the abundance. Okay, I said, oh, for now, no, but my abundance is not point three; it's point zero one. So how can I increase the dark matter abundance? Now, man, you have to go beyond your model because your two dark matter particles does not suffice. We see if they're identical. You have to go beyond your model to include another particle which is co-annihilating with your dark matter particle so that you can enhance the overall dark matter abundance. Okay? So this one I just play with my own model. This one, I have this one, and this co-annihilation I have to go beyond my own model to enhance. Okay? And the third, so this, so I showed, means the following. So the, the annihilation of dark matter into standard model particles, this sigma v here, so as I said, omega is proportional to 1 over sigma. And this sigma v, I didn't explain, but it's actually a thermal sigma v. What, I'm, what is this thermal means, these brackets? What do they mean? They mean that it's not just the annihilation cross-section now that I compute in a laboratory. The cross-section of dark matter particles throughout the evolution of the universe, so which is changing in time, the temperature. So the and of mass energy for that sigma v is changing throughout the history of the universe. So I have to average over the history of the universe, okay? Over since these dark matter particles were produced until now. So that's what this is. Fine. But as you know, some particles, maybe for those at least who have done the exercise tomorrow, I'm just going to speak to them just for a little second. So to solve that exercise, remember that we had to compare degrees of freedom before and after, and they change. So what I'm saying is this sigma v changes also because the annihilation cross-section depends on the degrees of freedom you have available at a given time. Now, going back to everybody, so the annihilation cross-section, this thermal average annihilation cross-section depends on, okay, I'm here, my mass is 100 GeV. So if it's today, so I just, the, my mass, the center of mass energy is my mass. I'm non-relativistic dark matter particle, I'm a, I have a I know, 100 GeV mass. Okay, so what are the particles in the standard model which have a mass below 100 GeV? Almost everybody, except for the top and the Higgs. Okay, so I can relate into everybody except for the top and the Higgs. So in my annihilation, my computation, I'm going to account for all the degrees of freedom of the standard model particles, except the ones that belong to the top and the Higgs. But if my mass is 200, then I'm going to include all of them. But OK, for now, so what? So if it, there's the mass you determine how many degrees of freedom you count. No, because if I have 100, but I'm in the early universe, the energy that the universe provides to me is large. So even if I have a mass of 100, I might have access to annihilate to something heavier. So I have to account for that degrees of freedom. So the more degrees of freedom you have, the more efficiently the dark matter particles annihilate. So the larger is the sigma v. Okay, so the more degrees of freedom, the larger the sigma v. But the larger the sigma v is smaller the abundance. So one way of reducing the abundance of a given model, the abundance of dark matter in a given model, is by threshold. What's threshold? Whether, where you are when that annihilation takes, takes place. Which moment this annihilation takes place? If it includes the top or does it include the top? It includes the Higgs or does it include the Higgs? It includes the W or does it include the W? And this will change the abundance. So I'm going to show you some plots. So I'm saying that whenever there is a mass, I have to account for the degrees of freedom of that particle. 
So you're going to see in many of these plots throughout the literature, these guys have a curve which is smooth, and then eventually there's, there's something like this, a bump. Well, you can't see that one. <laughs> these bumps here on these smooth curves for the relic densities, be sure that there is some particle being which wasn't produced before now can be produced. So there was a particle, which is the dark matter particle. There was, for instance, a particle, let's like say the top, which the dark matter of 100 GV, 150 GV didn't have access to it. But eventually, let's say if I make the mass 170, then it includes the top in the calculation. So there is a bump in that annihilation, the abundance, and then the cross section, the abundance of dark matter particle increases. This is the annihilation cross section, so the abundance will decrease. So I have an abundance, let's say it's here, omega, and then included at the top, this bump, which will be now downwards, and then you have a smaller abundance. Every time that you see a bump in a curve for abundance, it's because some particle, some threshold happened. So a new particle was included in, in this process, which made the uh, cross-section larger and the abundance is smaller. So you see these bumps in several of these, these slides I'm going to show. So we already know what they are. So there are three ways how you can change your predictions for the vanilla 0.3 model in this WIMP miracle. One is through resonance. Second is through co-annihilation. And the third is through threshold effects. Okay? So we have, yes. Yes, in the very early universe. So when we were here, <laughs> let's say that the temperature of the universe was very large, the 100 GV. So even a particle which is the mass is really small, that particle can produce 100 GV dark matter, right? Because the energy back then was already 100. So it doesn't matter the mass of a particle. You can produce dark matter is 100. But if the mass is really light, like an electron, half MeV, you cannot produce the dark matter if the mass of dark matter is 150. But the temperature is 100, so you cannot produce because your electron mass is really small, and the temperature is 100, you won't have a center of mass energy which is larger than the mass I want to produce. Okay, so at some point, yes, they could produce dark matter particles, but when that happen, that's, that's the point. That's why you have to average over the expansion of the universe. <coughs> okay, so today, so there will be some slides on these candidates, but I'm going to talk about just a few of them. I won't have time. You can ask me questions about each one of these zoo of candidates. I can explain you how you can have a, a, a plausible dark matter model for each one of them. So this figure is not quite nice there. So I'm going to start with sterile neutrinos. So I'm going to erase this part, okay? Uh, most of the things today will be on the board. Uh, Sterile neutrinos, they are popular because of the active neutrinos. <laughs> and one way, so this is a line of research at the moment in theoretical physics, is how you can connect or tie dark matter physics to neutrino physics at the same time. So how can you have, can have expertise on dark matter and neutrino physics at the same time in theoretical physics? Well, if you have a model where you can address both, you can address dark matter and neutrino masses, active neutrino masses at the same time. And the, the simplest way to do it is that there'll be a bit more technical here. So this Andrea has introduced to you some, some of the things regarding neutrino masses before. So neutrinos are massless in the standard model because we do not have right-handed neutrinos in the standard model. But let's say I have this, in the standard model, you have something like this. I add to the standard model something like that, where L is the lepton doublet. So this doublet comes because the standard model, for those who haven't seen it, 
the standard model, we have some gauge symmetries, and one of them is the SU2. And this SU2 doublet gives you that neutrino and electron. So I didn't put the flavor because, as Andrea explained, I cannot put, strictly speaking, I cannot put neutrino of an electron here. I can put it in a neutrino of one. Okay? All right. So the point is this interaction, so I won't prove it. From this interaction, if I have this in a model and add these two Lagrangians, okay, I won't motivate them. But they are really well, nicely well motivated dark matter models, even not dark matter models, neutrino models, where you can have this Lagrangian. And there are very nice phenomenological implications to that Lagrangian. If you add this Lagrangian, you're going to find that, so I'm going to use the notation that Andre used. I'm going to put the final. Yes. So hope, hopefully you can read this. So what I'm writing here is the mass of the actinic neutrinos and the mass of this n particle, which I will call stellar neutrino. So stellar neutrino, I'm assuming, is a particle called capital M. Okay. So if this stellar neutrino exists, and I have this interaction added to the center model. What happens is that the masses of the active neutrinos will be proportional to this, and the mass of the external neutrinos will be proportional to that. So I didn't not, I'm not explaining you where this n comes from. I'm not explaining you how I can write down this Lagrangian. Just take for granted that I can do that. Okay. Uh, <coughs> what I'm saying is, let's neutrinos have about one eV. Okay. Again, just let's talk about. Uh <coughs> Order approximations, for instance, just to have an idea what the, what the scales are. Uh, if this guy is very, very large, this M, the mass of this stellar neutrino is very, very large. It is very large. This M Dirac, M Dirac is the mass of, for instance, of the particles in the standard model. What is M Dirac? It's something related to the Higgs valve. The valve of the Higgs in the center model is about 246 GeV, okay? 246, 200. So let's just think of something. 200, or let's say 100, just to have an order of magnitude. So 10 to the fourth here. So I need this, this thing to be very, very large so I can get a mass of the neutrinos of EV. So naively speaking, if this is true, and you want to have a stellar neutrinos to explain the active neutrino mass without doing anything funny, then you need these active these stellar neutrinos or whatever you want to call it. Some people call it stellar neutrinos. Some people call it right-handed neutrino. It doesn't really matter how you call it. Then this guy has to be very, very heavy. Okay. But I can also play around. I can play with this number because in this number in the amount of Lagrangian, it's not just like that. There is a coupling, which I call Yukawa coupling, involved, which will pop up here. And I can suppress, so I can have this Y open up, popping up here. So I can take this Y to be very small, and then M's, capital M doesn't have to be that large. So I can play around with these two numbers. So the stellar neutrino, right-handed neutrino, whatever you want to call it, doesn't doesn't have to be necessarily that heavy. It can be I you know MeV if I want, KeV if I want. Not talking about data. I'm just saying. Theoretically speaking, can I do it? Yes, I can. Okay. All right. So let's say that I want to this neutrino to have masses of about KeV or GeV or whatever. So that's what that plot is. So Andrea has shown the explicit explicit expression for this sign theta, which is the mixing angle between this capital N and the active neutrinos. And then Andrea has shown that, I'm not, I'm not sure if you've shown this, the plot you just explained, right? I think we're, one of the questions related to that, whether you could have the stellar neutrinos as dark matter. 
And then I said, now we're going to see this on Thursday. So <coughs> from this thing, this N will mix with the active neutrinos here. And this mixing, I'm parameterized in terms of this theta, sine theta there. So this mixing. If I want stellar neutrinos to be the dark matter of our universe, through oscillations, so that's one of the things that he mentioned, since they'll mix, this capital N will mix with the active neutrinos, they might oscillate between each other. If their mass are very heavy, the difference in mass is very large, they cannot oscillate. But if it's not that large, then maybe they can oscillate each other. So through this oscillation of active neutrinos, capital N, as active neutrinos, capital N, can produce Ns, and these Ns will be around today. So it's one of the I think was the first, was it Dodson and Wheeler were, were, were the first, right? Yeah, so they were the first proposed stellar neutrinos as dark matter through this oscillation. So if stellar neutrinos are produced through oscillation, which is called the dodson wheeler mechanism, you have to be in this, I don't know, we, even if we call it that, I know, it's sort of brownish, whatever. Huh? Flicks? Okay, so I'm not old enough, so <laughs> <laughs> so you should be around here, okay? And all these things here, funny in color, are bounds. So they are m much more bounds than this. This is a very old figure. So they are bound that goes around here is excluded. So I'm, what I'm saying is, you should be here, theoretically speaking, and that's the formula for the abundance of these ends. The stellar neutrino, right hand neutrino, whatever you want to call it, is there. So just look at the number. So uh, Andrea mentioned that this mixing angle has to be really small, around 10 to minus 9 or so, if you want to have a stellar neutrino of KeV. If so if you want, in this vanilla framework, I can go beyond that, this vanilla framework, the same way for the cold relic, I had exceptions to that case change the abundance for the formula of the abundance, the final abundance. I can change for external neutrino, I can change for axons, I can change for gravitinos, I can change for whatever. Okay, so in this vanilla framework, so you expect the abundance of the neutrinos to be around there. And then th there is some data which excludes that form of producing neutrinos in the early universe. The external neutrinos are the dark matter. Yeah. Oh. The external neutrinos are the dark matter through oscillations are produced through oscillations, they are excluded now. Uh, so there are many ways, I mean many, many ways how I can push this line downwards and have here, have there, have here, have there. Many, many ways, yes? Yeah, this one, this dotted so wheel draw is the relic density curve. Ah, yeah, data, they excluded that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the, this thing is integral is a bound. So everything inside that region is excluded. Everything inside here is excluded. Everything above this thing, this black line is excluded. But there are other bounds I said. There's an old figure. There are bounds that come around here. Okay. So one thing that you might ask, so if we for now, the where these bounds come from? So we've just said. I think someone mentioned in the previous days that this since this ends mix with the active neutrinos, then I can write this piece here. So I have this N, which mix with the active neutrinos. So let's say I can do a mix, and then through this active neutrino, I can have a W, an electron, a neutrino, back again, and meet a photon. So this photon happens to be at the X-ray range. So you can observe, try to look for X-ray lines to place a bound on the stellar neutrino as dark matter, which mix with the active neutrinos. Okay. So if, if it doesn't mix, then gone. This bound is gone. But then you have to come up with a way how you, you produce this guy in the first place. No, today. So they will decay. 
today and you observe with telescopes. So one of these telescopes is this called Integral. Fermi is a satellite, so you also would search for the same thing. But Fermi, this one is different because look at the energy, the mass. It's very large. So you're actually not looking for X-ray, you're looking for gamma rays coming from that. So depending on the energy you're talking about, you look for gamma, ray rays, gamma rays or X-rays. But this, the physics is the same. So you can constrain stellar neutrinos just using uh, data. And one nice thing about Fermi is that the data is totally public to anybody. I mean, anybody in this room can ac have access to live data. What? Okay, that's pretty good. <coughs> Yeah, so the so Andre explained that if you have an active neutrino, there'll be a cosine theta. Let's say oh, oh, I'll do the same thing, two flavors approximation. So let's say an active neutrino, neutrino of electron here would be neutrino one plus sine theta. Neutrino two, and then you have n okay. minus sine theta. Neutrino one plus cosine theta. Neutrino n two. Sorry. So these neutrinos, these guys, are not actually the mass eigenstates. What you have, you have two particles which you mix with each other. You don't know which one is which. So you have to diagonalize a matrix to so to realize where the physical states, where the guys were can really observe. We should have a mass. But these things are the mixing angle that appear over there. So what I'm trying to detect is not this guy, would be this guy or this guy. So when we call n, since the mass is splitting between this guy and this guy is can be sufficiently large, so this guy, this n, will be mostly one, and the electron neutrino will be mostly the other. You say, okay, I have sort of two, actually two states if the mixing angle is really small. So it's like you and I are mixed. You have a long hair, have a short hair, spiky hair, and then we are mixed with each other. People may not distinguish you from me, but if they mix in, we don't interact much with each other. So it's now this guy is Farinaldo and what's his name? Davi. This guy is Davi. So if the mixing angle between the two of us is small, I can discriminate between the two of us. So it's the same thing happening there. All right. <coughs> so this is. So that was one. Okay. How much? How much time do I have? Half an hour, that's pretty good. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about one of the most popular dark matter models in the literature. Yes, Pedro? Yeah, so here is the Higgs. So I'm saying that partly comes from the Higgs, partly comes from this M. Because if you look at the active neutrino mass, there is something that's MD, which comes from this term, and partly comes from this M, which is this mass I'm not explaining. So the active neutrino mass comes from both terms. Yeah, I'm not explaining why, where it comes from. So there you might have a model which is called B minus L. Barry and lepton numbers are global symmetries in the standard model. So you can gauge these global symmetries, have them as gauge. So the standard model would be, this is a more technical question, so it'll be more technical. So the standard model is SU3 color SU2 left U1 hypercharge. Then I can add another one, B minus L. If baryon lepton numbers are really gauge symmetries, by construction, I require the existence of this NR. So I'm explaining you 
why I have to add this NR. There are many variations to that, many. That's the most popular one. So then I have to explain the mass of this guy. And also I haven't explained it yet because in these models, the vanilla models, they just explain the existence of this NR, whether you call it zero neutrinos or right-handed neutrinos, but they do not actually explain where this mass comes from. So then you have to go beyond that, for instance, the same way the Higgs exists to give a mass to the standard model particles, I can add a no new fundamental scalar to give rise to this capital N. Yes? Mm -hmm. It's really complicated. Yeah, right. So this thing, if I consider, the, the point is, the heavier this guy is compared to the active neutrinos, which is like one EV, we are talking about key EV. Remember the previous picture was key EV would be up to, where is this, GV or something. Right? Let's see, 10 to 8, 10 to 7 KV. So the larger, the heavier the guy, the N is, the more decoupled he is from the active neutrinos. So the more you can distinguish one from the other, from from another, okay? All right. So, so now let me discuss this model, which is the most popular one among this uh, beyond the standard model extensions for dark matter, which is called the Higgs portal. So the Higgs is popular by itself. So why not having the Higgs? as the, you know what this guy is? I referred as mediator, right, so far? Now I'm gonna refer this, this is the, how we call it today. I'm gonna refer, refer to this as the portal. Instead of talking V as the mediator, I'm gonna talk V as the portal. So what happened if, instead of this, I had that? What will happen? If I have the Higgs being the portal, being the mediator, being the scalar boson that connects between the dark matter particles and the standard model particles, that connects, so people talk in different ways, the visible sector and the dark sector. If the Higgs is the portal that connects the visible sector and the dark sector, what happens? Well, the Higgs properties we know up to 20%, according to the lati latest CMS and, and Atlas data. Uh, so what happens? So let's say that this is the interaction I have. So I'm gonna write there here. So let's say I have the Higgs portal. So of Kai Kai, Higgs, then a model. I say, well, but this dark matter particle can be a fermion because the fermion line as I wrote, but can also be a scalar. And it can also be a vector. Because as one of the questions Orlando raised yesterday, but in all though in this thermal production cold relic scenario you're talking about, do we know the, the nature of dark matter? I said, no, you don't know the nature of dark matter because everything I've mentioned at that point what was a cross-section that particle possessed, right? So I didn't mention whether it was a scalar frame or nothing. I was just saying, suppose the cross-section is around the weak scale. That's what I said. But I, I emphasize that depending on the details of your model, yes, things can change. <laughs> and for those who are experimentalists in the room, that's why it's so important what you do for us. The reason is the following. Since I can play around with my models to have different predictions, therefore it's your job is pretty amazing, is to cover the basis, okay? The different scenarios that you can have. Because if you exclude one assumption, I say, well, let me go back and change my assumption to have a different result. So it's important that you cover all the possibilities because as Andrea has pointed out, many of the things we discover throughout the history of science 
It's not by just, hey, this is the way. No, you assume different ways and the experimenters go testing all the assumptions and then we end up with the solution. So you can also have a vector in the dark matter particle. So this is called the Higgs portal, where you have a scalar, fermion, or vector. And the predictions are different. So Fabio will mention it tomorrow. Are you, yes. No. They are different. And complex, they might be different. The same for vector. Okay. In this vanilla scenario, if you have a vector or a scalar, this thing will change by a factor of two. It was whether it's particle or antiparticle, you change by a factor of two at the end. But if it's fermion, Dirac, or Majorana, then it changes completely. Okay? It's very, very different. The way you write down these things. In a UV complete model, so for instance, in a self-consistent model where you really want to explain things, these things change. Okay, so just look at this plot. I'm going to explain what these things are. So I'll just ask for everybody, so make uh, the life of Fab a little bit easy for tomorrow. The only thing I mentioned yesterday and today was this. Right? Now, I'll take the same diagram, the same. I'm just going to flip around, tilt the diagram. I'm going to tilt again. This is some cross-section here. Another cross-section related to this one, another cross-section related to this one. So this one refers to the annihilation of dark matter particles, because you have two incoming dark matter particles and two standard matter particles at the very end. So this is the probe also known as indirect dark matter detection. This, you have a dark matter particle which is scatters off a nucleus and then when the scattering takes place and then you have another dark matter particle there and a standard matter particle here which is called drug detection. And this one you have two dark matter par two standard matter particles in the very beginning like two protons which they collide and might produce dark matter. This is called Collider searches, such as the LHC. So you have these three ways of probing dark matter models in different detectors. That's why the dark matter is this dark matter complementarity is so important because you might search for dark matter colliders, in direct detection, and direct detection experiments. You can combine the three. Fine, but as far as the theories, theory is concerned, that's this. Not, not always, okay? Again, there are caveats to that. This is the same interaction that I'm probing at different energy scales. So the cross-section I'm probing is the same at different energy scales. Therefore, I can correlate these signals, okay? Because the cross-section, the process is the same. So, and that's what these guys are doing in this one. So let's say this lambda is the coupling that appears here. Lambda, lambda, and lambda. So it's the same lambda I'm probing. So you say, okay, I won't explain the details. You see these spiky things? You already know what they are. So if you see this thing happens, for instance, at half of the Higgs mass, so when the, there is a Higgs resonance there, so you see the spike. This thing here, you have the Higgs resonance, you cannot see here. 
about a hundred and something, you see the you're going to see the Z ma the Z threshold, it's ninety. You might see this one because this the is a log log scale, you cannot see, but there should be a bump around here which should be close to the top mass. Every time there is something going on, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, but once you wrote down your Lagrangian, you're already telling what the width is. Because the width of a given particle, once you determine what the Lagrangian is, you al I already know the width. I just compute the branch ratio, the width of each one of the individual channels. I don't know how, how wide that width is. Yes. Right, so, yes, but the point is, I'm f as I have to recompute the width of the Higgs as I scan throughout the dark matter mass. So I'm computing, recomputing all the time. So the Higgs might decay invisibly into dark matter because I'm changing the dark matter mass. Yes, you have to compute that. Yes, have you? The Planck? Which, wait, which one? Ah. Yeah. So. This plank is just the relic, this, this one this is not actually a constraint, it's just the relic density curve. This one, not the plank constraint. It's just, it's, we refer to this plank because it's just the plank value of omega h squared equal 0.1. But it's not the plank constraint. But Fabio talked about indirect detection bounds using plank data. So there are different things. Uh, so these bounds here, I want to explain the details because Fabio will cover them. You just say, every time it's within these regions, you're excluded by a given experiment. Whether it's xenon one ton, projections for LZ, and the Higgs invisible decay, you should be excluded around this area, which goes like this. So everything within that region is excluded. So I said, well, this Wimp miracle might be easy for now. Whatever model I can come up with, I can have a dark matter candidate. Yeah, you can have a dark matter candidate. It doesn't matter that doesn't mean that your dark matter candidate is plausible, is feasible, is realized in nature. You might have a candidate. Whether that candidate is plausible, is agreed with data, is another thing. Okay? Yes. Yes, we know some of the Higgs properties. For instance, we know the Higgs mass. We know how the Higgs couples to quarks. Some of the questions, all of them. But we know, at the best of our knowledge, that's exactly the couplings I use. We can use. Then it's a different thing. Then I, these relic density curves will be all over the place. Okay, so you do for the Higgs because something you already know. So it's like okay, it's more predictive because I know the Higgs properties so at some extent. So I'm just showing this is this thing you have to capture here is that whether I have a scalar dark matter a fermion dark matter, a vector dark matter, you see that the next generation of experiments will basically exclude the dark matter models which interact with the Higgs. That's the message. The Higgs portal will be scrutinized, be really hard to be a portal for dark matter. Higgs portal will be really tested in the next generation of experiments. So which is nice because ha coincides with the Higgs, very intense Higgs searches at LHC. So we can, if a sign we are signaling the other, we can have a prediction for dark matter. If we see a signal for dark matter, we can have a prediction for the LHC. So you guys are very lucky for living in this period of time. <laughs> yes. No, the energy will change. The coupling have to remain the same. Otherwise, I, they will be totally disconnected from each other. Yes. Yes, that's a great question. So you can have really 
dependence on lambda because the scales are different, so the lambda might change, and you can account for those. These things for the Higgs portal, they won't change much. For some of the cases where you have a very light portal, we have a light, very light mediator, these things will change a lot, especially for direct detection, which happens at very low scale. That's a great question. So another way, so I'm just going to show this to you. I'm going to skip this slide very quick. Go very fast. So I'm including, everybody includes, so this, is, this paper is not mine. This paper from uh, Christoph Feninger. And what they do is, so just in this process, these figures here, which might be pretty, they include how the Higgs decays, whether it's into W, W, W stars, Z, Z stars, how the dark matter particle, which is a scalar, how it interacts with standard model particles, taking into account all the Higgs properties, the width, and so on. So I'm going to skip this one. But this, everything I mentioned, if you see the difference, before was for the freeze out. Freeze out is thermal relic in equilibrium with standard model particles. You get an abundance, which is 1 over sigma. And the sigma has to be around the weak scale. So far, that's what you've seen. However, I can still change that. How? If the dark matter was produced non-thermally, let's say that the interaction with the standard model particles was not around the weak scale. So the cross was really small. So we do not like to, the dark matter particles would not like to interact with standard model particles. When you solve that Boltzmann equation, which gets really complicated, you don't get this omega 1 over sigma. It's totally different. So what happens is the opposite. So I won't prove that. It's just impossible for the amount of time I have. I don't know why it's appearing this. It's 5.3. But the only thing you need to remember is this following. So if the dark matter is produced non-thermally in the universe, not through the preacher I, I described, the abundance of S, abundance of the dark matter particle, in the same Higgs portal, is proportional to 10 to 21 lambda squared. This lambda that I mentioned, lambda, 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 and lambda. So in order for a dark matter to be produced non-thermally in the early universe and get the right omega, the right abundance, the coupling with the standard model particles has to be around 10 to minus 11 or so. Very, very small. The point is for experimentalists, you say, well, it's tricky because a coupling that small, it means a cross section really small, and how I'm going to probe that with an experiment. Pretty tough. Okay? So that's why when experimentalists talk about dark matter, they usually implicitly assume thermal freeze out because the cross section around the weak scale is something I can measure. If it's freezing, then it's, it's a nightmare. So one of the models e e you're going to see tomorrow, or next week, I guess, is the dark photon. I want to explain again the details. Just going to go through this plot really quickly. Suppose that we have the photon, quantum electrodynamics, electromagnetism, which is really pretty. And then instead of the photon, I have also something which a partner, a dark photon, that interacts with the standard model particles just like the photons in the standard model. Just like the photons we know. The photons we know, they interact with the standard model particles or with everything you can think of if they have electric charge. Right? Something has to have electric charge to interact with the photon. Okay, so if I have something which is like a photon, but it's massive, not massless, it's like a photon, interacts with only particles that have electric charge, but has a mass. So we call it dark photon. So you have a theory that you can come up with this mass and so on. So I want to explain that. So let's assume that you have a photon the, in nature, which is massive. So I call it dark. The interaction is not like the photon. It's suppressed because it was just like the photon I would have observed already. So the coupling, I erase this one. The photon interacts with whatever, then a model, then a model, 
And this coupling here is the charge Q of that final state. But if this guy is a dark photon, since I haven't observed the wetty, should not be the charge, should be a fraction of the charge, which I call epsilon. The fractional charge of that charge. That's the epsilon that's popping up here. So this, I think this is the, the one of the candidates most extensively searched in the literature is the dark photons. Why? Because it's like testing electromagnetism. So it's not that hard. It's not that expensive. So you can test dark photons in nature. And there are many, many experiments that can test that. So one of them is, is I'm going to skip this. I'm lacking time, lacking going out of time. Uh, this is DAMIC. So it is direct detection experiment, which is this direction here. If dark photons are there in nature, they might go through your detector. Since they couple directly to the charge of the fermions in that material, so they can strip off an electron of silicon. And then when you strip off the electron, the electron, because of there is an electric field, will be drifted. And when you collect these electrons, they'll form some current. And then you can observe that current somehow. So there are bounds on these dark photons. There are many experiments from the, based on the mass. So depending on the mass you have, one experiment is better than the other. But it's nice that some of the experiments were sort of complementary to each other. You might ask, so I try to say this, even as a theorist, that say, for now, though, is this bound here, for instance, is this bound here irrelevant, this black one, because this guy is there? No, it's not irrelevant, because this one is better, right? The bound is excluding more. No, not irrelevant, because it can change how things happen. So one detector might see some effects that the others don't. So at the nuclear level, things can change. So one detector and one target can see things differently from the other target. Therefore, I need the two different targets so that you know at the nuclear level how the dark matter interacts. So it's not because one is more constraining than the other, because one is irrelevant. It's not, OK? So I'll just talk the last one. You go, let me see. This is the last one, because I have, what, it's five minutes. So this is the called asymmetric dark matter. So we know that we have matter in nature, but we don't see antimatter flying around easily. Uh, we have to produce them. Uh, this asymmetric stands for a class of models where you can tie the dark matter abundance of the universe to the matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe. Is a class of models where you tie the abundance of dark matter to the matter antimatter symmetry in the universe. And how you can do that, I, I guess is the only way you can do that is the following. Suppose you have an asymmetry in the early universe. So I can go for a concrete model for that if you want. Uh, you have an asymmetry in the universe which dark matter particles feel. Only dark matter particles feel. Dark matter were produced in the early universe, right? So they would annihilate or whatever. And when they interact with certain amount of particles, they sort of transfer that asymmetry that they had to certain amount of particles. If that asymmetry was something related to baryon number or these Sakharov conditions that he was talking about, you can create this leptogenesis and then create this matter anti matter symmetry. So one of the main the nice thing about this model is that, that you can correlate the abundance of the universe, the dark matter abundance in the universe, to the matter and time matter symmetry in the universe. But however, if you really want to correlate both, so I want to explain dark matter and the matter and time matter symmetry in the universe, I want. It's my taste. If it is, this is true, okay, you want that, the dark matter mass should be around 5 GeV. Okay, this is a prediction for the model. You want to explain both nicely? No caveats, nothing, naturally. 5 GV, around 5. Nothing, it's not, won't be 100. It'll be 5, 10, 2, around that. Okay? Plus minus 5, 5, plus minus 5. So you have a prediction, a very narrow prediction for the mass of dark matter to be. 
And that's nice, again, for the experimentalist, as I said, you need a road, very well-defined road to take. So these things, I'm gonna, that's the last plot before I finish. So you're going to see this plot a lot, again, next week, which is like this. Sigma, dark matter mass, and they are bounds, like this. Bound one, bound two, bound three, so on. There are many. So I'm not explaining the details. And they say, ah, uh, WIMPs, or weak interacting massive particles, particles we were produced thermally in the early universe, are on the siege. They are in, mm, being, they are in tension with the data because for thermal relics, that relation omega and sigma are sort of defined, so they should be around here. WIMP. So after some improvement, I'm going to exclude WIMPs as dark matter candidates. Please be re remember, this is the vanilla. Omega, one of a sigma. You've learned in the past two days that I can't change that. So this statement is not true. People who say that, they're trying to oversell the results. It's not true. Okay? So it's still consistent. The vanilla models, yes, it's true. Strictly speaking, if you want to say, strictly speaking, yeah, vanilla models of WIMPs are in tension with the data. So with some further improvement, you might exclude the WIMPs. The vanilla WIMPs as dark matter candidates. But as I said, this asymmetric dark matter, let's say this is about 10 GV. And this is about 1 TV. M chi. The asymmetric dark matter should be around here. Because I'm saying it can be all this region here, asymmetric. Well, asymmetric dark matter is around here, so some of them in tension. So it means that we further improvement, also I'm going to exclude the asymmetric dark matter? No. The vanilla asymmetric dark matter? Yes. Okay? And there are models which predict a cross section around here. And there are models that predict a cross section on this left part here. This is called freezing. And these ones are called, I'm going to call them heavy. However, whatever you want to call them. Heavy and these, they are so whatever you want to call them. So that's it where sort of the region where you predict. So I say, wow, that's really nice. Because with new experimental limits, you're going to exclude them all. The vanilla ones? Yes. For all of them, the statement is true. The vanilla ones? Yes. Is that important? Yeah, yes, pretty important. Because you're going to now go back to your assumptions and see what you have to come up with so that you can bring these cross sections down. Why is this relevant? Because by redoing your assumptions, remaking them, you're going to eventually uh, realize what is the nature of dark matter. OK? So thank you. OK, so we have time for one question. And then please do write down your questions so that we can discuss them later today. In the back. Right. Yes. So you have to. You can play with both. So let's say so for some people, they have a preferred dark matter candidate, and that's exactly what happens. You see communities having a preferred dark matter, small communities having a preferred dark matter candidate. So they just try to fight a way, find out a way how they can go back within their favorite dark matter model. 
So each one of them, they have come up with a way how you can bring down that expected, the vanilla results, expectations. So you can do that. And, and tomorrow I will try and show how in you, the experiments to actually do, the experiments that you use to create these constraints, as Fernando is showing, they do not access the parameters of your model. They just access the phenomenological cross-sections. Right. Then what they mean in your favorite model depends on your model. And then you go to beyond WIM. Okay? Because okay. this lambda is, is not the observable that you see. So it's just when you see a result and you interpret in terms of your particle physics, which at the end you might relate to lambda or something else. Okay? Just a reminder that we'll have the poster madness, free poster advertisement before lunch. So those who have posters, please be ready. Um, and let's thank Farinaldo again. He will be uh, around, but that's his last lecture, so let's thank him again. Right.